Yeah. And um, I just want to make a couple of remarks. One is that a lot of people have been mispronouncing his last name. <laughs> it's been pronounced Bhargava. First of all, the second and the first syllable. And secondly, for example, <laughs> it's, it's a P or the H in your throat. <laughs> of course, the second name is good because it doesn't involve any difficult things. As you know, there are words in Sanskrit. The first name is, means charming. <laughs> hey, why is that funny? So, um, all right, so let's um, um, listen to him speak and um, on the square tree values of polynomial discriminants. Did I say that? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> No, thanks so much. It's always wonderful to be back at MSRI, and thank you to the organizers uh, for this awesome conference. And yeah, if you have more questions about my name, I'm happy to take questions afterwards. <laughs> uh, okay, so what I want to talk about today is a, it's a very old question in analytic number theory uh, about understanding square-free values taken by a polynomial. So I won't go too much into the history of what is known, uh, about square free values of polynomials. Uh, this being an analytic number theory conference, the general problem of understanding how often a uh, multivariable integer polynomial takes square free values, uh, it's in general unknown. Uh, in fact, if you take the polynomial x to the 4 plus 2, it's not even known that it takes infinitely many square free values. Uh, for one variable polynomials, one does know the density of square free values, assuming the ABC conjecture. Uh, but for general multivariable integer polynomials, even under ABC, uh, we don't know uh, how often multivariable integer polynomials take square free values. So that's a general unsolved problem. But if you have a certain polynomial in mind that you need to know the square free values of, then you can hope to maybe exploit the special shape of the polynomial that, uh, that you have use any extra known structure of that polynomial to try and determine the density of square free values by exploiting that extra structure. And so that's what I want to talk about uh, today for a particular polynomial that comes up uh, very often uh, throughout mathematics uh, and in, pr in particular number theory. So this work that I'm talking about is joint, I should have said, with uh, Aril Schenker and Jerry Wang. And the polynomial that we're interested in is is the discriminant polynomial of a polynomial. <laughs> so if one, if one takes a monic polynomial of degree n, and you take its coefficients to be indeterminates, and you take its discriminant, then the discriminant is itself a polynomial in the coefficients uh, of your polynomial with indeterminate coefficients. So just to be concrete, so if you take the discriminant of the polynomial x squared plus a1x plus a2, okay, so we'll always take monic polynomials uh, with uh, indeterminate coefficients a1 through an, if we're talking about degree n polynomials, so this is degree two. Uh, the coefficients are a1 and a2. And the discriminant, as we all know, is a1 squared minus 4a2. Okay, and if we have a degree three polynomial, we can take its discriminant, it has coefficients a1, a2, and a3, and its discriminant uh, turns out to be that expression. And then I didn't write down the quartic one because it would have taken the whole slide. Uh, but in general, delta n, the discriminant of a degree n monic polynomial, uh, is a polynomial in n variables. Uh, and its degree, its weighted degree, is n times n minus 1, if you view the ith coefficient ai as having weight i. Okay, so for example, you can see in the degree 3 case, right, each of these terms here has degree 6. Right, if you view ai as having degree i. Right? So you have a3 squared, you have a2 cubed, right? all degree 6. So the discriminant is defined as the square of the products of the differences of the roots, and that you can express as a polynomial in the coefficients, uh, which is a weighted homogeneous polynomial of degree n times n minus 1. And so the question is, 
when you take all integer monic polynomials, okay, x to the n plus a1, x to the n minus 1 plus dot, dot, dot plus a n, and you order them by their height. Their height is going to be defined as the maximum of the absolute values of ai to the 1 over i. So we take ai, raise it to the 1 over i so that their degrees are all comparable. We take their maximums, and we define that to be the height of a polynomial, a monic polynomial, and we want to know if we order all monic polynomials uh, by this height, this maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients, uh, appropriately weighted. Uh, and the question is, what is the density of monic polynomials, integer polynomials, such that the discriminant of that polynomial is square-free? Okay, so we're trying to understand the square-free, what is the density of square-free values taken by the discriminant polynomial, right, of degree n monic polynomials? In particular, is the density uh, even positive? Okay, that's also uh, was not known. Okay, so this, is a, this is a classical question. The reason uh, it's arisen in, in number theory, the question of whether a discriminant is square free, is that often one constructs number fields by, uh, by taking Q adjoint X and modding out by a monic polynomial. And one is interested in constructing uh, the ring of integers in that number field. And it turns out that you can do that very easily if the discriminant of f is square free. So, so when we take algebraic number theory, we often consider number fields that are defined as q bracket x mod f of x. Uh, so we call that k sub f. And then one's interested in constructing the ring of integers in kf. And if f has square free discriminant, then the ring of integers is just given by z bracket x mod f of x. So this is what we always want to do in algebraic number theory. When we're given a polynomial f of x, we hope <laughs> that the ring of integers is z bracket x minus f of x. And that will definitely happen if the discriminant of f of x is square free. The reason being that if it wasn't maximal, then if you went to the maximal order, a square factor would go away from the discriminant. But if the discriminant was square free, that can't happen. So that's, a, uh, that's something very useful about uh, monic polynomials of square free discriminant is that you immediately know the ring of integers inside q bracket x mod f of x. It's just z bracket x mod f of x. So if there are lots of such polynomials around, then you have an easy recipe for the ring of integers in many number fields. And moreover, so not only do we know the ring of integers, but in that case, uh, the ring of integers is monogenic. It's just generated by one element, uh, and it has square-free discriminant. So those two properties are also often useful when you have a number field. But this, this raises a more general question, which is when you take integer monic polynomials and order them by height, what is the probability that z bracket x mod f of x does actually give the ring of integers inside q bracket x mod f of x? So the discriminant being square free is a sufficient condition, but it's not a necessary condition. So this density would be strictly bigger. And we can ask, if you pick a random monic polynomial, what's the probability that z bracket x mod that polynomial does give the ring of integers inside q bracket x mod that polynomial. And if it was high, then we'd be happy in algebraic number three courses, all often just taking f, z bracket x mod f of x and hoping that's the ring of integers. Uh, and that is, a, that is a good bet to take, because the conjectured answer, which is due to Hendrik Lenstra, is that this density right, of those f of x for which z bracket x mod f of x is the ring of integers and q bracket x mod f of x, uh, the probability uh, that that happens, if you pick a random f, uh, is 6 over pi squared, uh, independent of n, independent of the degree. So you pick a random degree n polynomial, uh, the probability is, should be 6 over pi squared that just z bracket x mod f of x is the maximal order in its fraction field, which is about 60%. So better than 50-50 chance we pick a random polynomial that <laughs> that naive way of constructing the ring of integers will work. OK, so it would be nice to know that this is actually true. Uh, previously, it wasn't known that even a positive proportion had that uh, happening. So. so this formula, this density for when it's the maximal order is really nice, 6 over pi squared. The density, expected density for square-free discriminant is not as nice. Uh, but it was worked out what the conjectured answer should be. So based on Lenstra's computation, uh, for the maximal orders, uh, Brackenhoff later gave explicit conjecture densities for square-free discriminants. Uh, the answer does depend on n. Uh, so here's, here's the expression. So, uh, 
Um, it's kind of a nice, uh, and I don't have a quick heuristic, but it's a, it's a you work out what, uh, what the local, uh, pro what the probability FP is for, for a polynomial to give the ring of integers just over ZP. Uh, and that turns out to be one minus one over P squared for a very, very, ni for a very nice reason when you think about it. And so the six over pi squared is a product of those local densities, one minus one over p squared. Uh, for square-free discriminant, the expression is not quite as nice. So we want to work out the probability that locally uh, your discriminant is square-free. So in other words, what is the probability that a random polynomial has discriminant indivisible by p squared? And that's this expression lambda n of p. And Brackenhoff worked out what those probabilities are for each p. There are four different cases, depending on whether the degree is one, two, three, or at least four. <laughs> and that, these expressions only hold when p is not equal to two. Uh, when p equals two, uh, for degree one, the expression is just one. And uh, when n is at least two, the degree is at least two, then the expression is one half for the probability that a discriminant is divisible, indivisible by four. OK, so the probability that a random polynomial should have square-free discriminants should be uh, just the product of these, lambda, these local probabilities. So we define lambda n as the product of lambda n of p over all primes p. Then that, Brackenhoff conjectured, should be the density of degree n monic polynomials that have square-free discriminant. And so that's the, that's the theorem uh, that we prove. So if n is any degree, then when monic integer polynomials, f of x equals x to the n plus a1 x to the n minus 1, there shouldn't be a y there, sorry, plus dot 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 plus a n, uh, of degree n are ordered by their heights. Uh, the density having square free discriminant, first of all, it exists, and uh, it's positive, and in fact, it's that constant lambda n. And Turns out lambda n as n goes to infinity converges very quickly to a number, uh, which we call lambda. <laughs> uh, and that's about 35%, 35.8%. So if you pick a random uh, polynomial of reasonably high degree, then the chance that it has square-free discriminant is about 36%. Okay, any questions about the statement? For n equals 2, is it equivalent to? Oh, it's not. Uh, it's actually uh, because it's possible to have maximal orders that don't have, right? It's possible for a quadratic field to have a non square free discriminant. Even if the constants come out the same, that doesn't. Uh, wait, does the constant come out the same? Yeah, it should be different. Yeah, yeah. At p equals 2, it should be different. Yeah, so, that's a, so the question is, uh, if we order polynomials by discriminant instead of by height, and the answer is probably the answers are the same, but we don't even know how, how many polynomials of bounded discriminant there are asymptotically. And so that makes it a little harder to, um, to prove theorem, density theorems about a subset whose cardinality we don't know, although uh, it could be conceivable that you could do that. Yeah, but one doesn't expect the constants to change or the densities to change if you order by, by pretty much anything else. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'll be on the next page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. The point is that if we can sieve all the way to square free discriminants, then, uh, so uh, if we can sieve all the way to polynomials that have square free discriminant, then it's a strictly weaker sieve to sieve to all those polynomials that, uh, for which z bracket x mod f of x is the maximal order and q bracket x mod f of x. So given that we could do this sieve, we can also prove Leinster's conjecture. So that's, that's the second theorem. Uh, 
So the question is, how often does z bracket x might f of x give the ring of integers in q bracket x might f of x? Uh, and the second main theorem says that most monic integer polynomials have that property. So if you order all monic polynomials by, uh, by their heights, uh, then z bracket x might f of x is the ring of integers in its fraction field with probability uh, 6 over pi squared. So better chance than not that it will give you the ring of integers. I find that very comforting to know somehow. <laughs> so because 6 over pi squared is like 61%. OK, any questions about that? Uh, yeah, I want to describe one consequence for for number fields, because now we're suddenly producing lots of polynomials that are, so in other words, we're constructing lots of rings of integers in number fields. We can ask how many is that producing? Uh, and if you just work out how many distinct number fields this is producing, uh, it actually uh, gives the best known lower bounds on how many number fields there are in a given degree. So we note that if f of x is irreducible, and uh, with integer coefficients and monic with square free discriminant, then z bracket x might f of x uh, is the ring of integers. It's monogenic. It has square free discriminant. And a little known fact is that if a number field has square free discriminant, then it automatically has Galois group Sn. And so this is producing lots of degree n number fields with associated Galois group uh, Sn. And the thing to note is that if the height uh, of su such an f is less than x, then its discriminant will be at most x to the n times n minus 1. Right? The reason being that the height is a degree 1 homogeneous function, right? uh, weighted homogeneous function in the coefficients. The discriminant, as we said, is, a, is, is degree n times n minus 1. So if the height is at most x, the discriminant will be at most x to the n times n minus 1. Uh, and so if you count all polynomials of height less than x, they're x to the n times n plus 1 over 2 of them, uh, about. Uh, and they all have discriminant less than x to the n times n minus 1. Uh, so if you take roughly n, right, n times n plus 1 over 2 uh, minus 1, and then divide it by n times n minus 1, you get an exponent of 1 half plus 1 over n. So uh, a corollary is that for any degree n bigger than 1, the number of isomorphism classes of number fields of degree n uh, an absolute discriminant less than x that are monogenic uh, and have associated Galois group Sn uh, because they have square-free discriminant uh, is at least x to the 1 half plus 1 over n. So this gives the best known lower bounds for the number of degree n number fields of bounded discriminant. And moreover, we conjecture that uh, we actually, if we're only interested in monogenic number fields, in other words, those whose rings of integers are generated by one element, that this actually gives the correct order of magnitude. And of course, all the number fields that are constructed here also have square-free discriminant. And as we saw in Lillian's talk this morning, that property can be useful uh, as well. If we drop the moment, if we, the, if we want to count all number fields uh, of degree n with associated Galois group Sn, we expect that the answer should be greater than greater than x to the 1. Uh, uh, this is the best, uh, best known so far toward that direction, 1 half plus 1 over n. OK, any questions about the statement? I'm oh, sorry? Uh, it was, it was this is, so I think the best known bound was due to Ellenberg and Venkatesh, and it was, this is not too much bigger than theirs, I think. So it's around a half. Yeah. Oh, uh, so the question is why, why do we expect this to be the right exponent for monogenic number fields? Um, just the method of proof is really counting, 
essentially all polynomials of discriminant x to the n times n minus, I mean, all, all polynomials of discriminant, uh, how to say, when you're counting monogenic number fields, you really are just counting polynomials. So usually the problems of counting number fields and counting polynomials are very different. But if you're interested in counting monogenic number fields, then it is really essentially equivalent to counting uh, monic polynomials. The only problem is why we're not getting the exact answer uh, is because we're ordering by height rather than discriminant. Uh, but standard conjectures say that if you have, uh, if you have uh, a polynomial of discriminant at most x to the n times n minus 1, then you expect a positive proportion of them to actually have height less than x. And we are counting everything of height less than x. So that's why we think we're getting, we're counting actually a positive proportion of all such number fields. And so that's why we think that exponent should be correct. In fact, we give a conjectured constant, too, for what that constant should be. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so how do we get at the density uh, of square free values of this multivariable polynomial, namely the discriminant polynomial? Okay, so how do we get at the, the density of square free values? Well, let's start just generally. Suppose we have a general polynomial G in n variables with integer coefficients. We want to get at its square free values. So to count the square free values taken by this polynomial, Okay, as a standard in, uh, in SIF theory, we need to sieve away those points, a and z to the n, where the polynomial is a multiple of p squared for some large prime p. Right? That's always where the problem is in these sieves, is that they're large primes whose square divides your values. Okay, and those are hard to get a, get a handle on. If p is way larger than the range of the variables that, uh, that you're considering, and p squared divides uh, g at that point, it's very hard to get a handle on that. And that's what's been uh, difficult in all these uh, kinds of square free sieves. So we need to understand how can g of a become a multiple of p squared for large primes p, if, a, if p is large relative to a. So the observation that we use is that if g of a is congruent to 0 mod p squared, okay, for some a and z to the n, this can happen in two distinct ways and which should really be considered separately. Okay, it's a totally elementary observation, which is, okay, so the two ways that g of a can be a multiple of p squared. One is that g of a is a multiple of p squared for really mod p reasons, in that if you change a by something mod p, it continues to remain a multiple of p squared. Okay? So if g of a prime is congruent to 0 mod p squared for all a prime congruent to a mod p, then we say g of a is strongly a multiple of p squared. Okay, it's really strongly a multiple of p squared because if you just replace a by any translate by a multiple of p, it continues to remain a multiple of p squared. Okay, so that could happen. If it doesn't happen, we say it's weakly a multiple of p squared. So in other words, if g, that g of a is a multiple of p squared, but you can change a by some multiple of p so that it's not a multiple of p squared anymore. So in that case, it was kind of more weakly a multiple of p squared. Instead of strongly or weakly, I like the terminology. So in the first case, g of a is a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons. Okay, you translate a by something mod p, and it continues to stay a multiple of p squared. Uh, whereas in the second case, g of a is really a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons, that the residue a mod p squared really matters in making g a multiple of p squared. So these are two distinct things that can happen when g is a multiple of p squared at a. Is that, uh, is that clear? Any questions about? So just to give you an example, uh, if you take the two variable polynomial f of x comma y equals x times y, then you can see both cases happening, right? So if you look at x times y, it can be multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, namely when both x and y are multiples of p, right? Because then, then if you change x and y by any multiples of p, it'll continue x times y will continue to be a multiple of p squared. So that's a case where x times y is a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons. But it could also be the case that x is a multiple of p squared and y is relatively prime to p. And that's a case where x, y is a multiple of p squared really for mod p squared reasons. Because if you changed x by just p, that wouldn't be true anymore, that x times y is a multiple of p squared. And so one elementary but key observation is that it's natural to try and estimate how often each of 
these two different kinds of uh, becoming multiple p squared happen. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at those two cases uh, separately. OK, so the point is that the case of strong multiples, in other words, multiples of p squared for mod p reasons, can actually be handled totally generally for an arbitrary uh, multivariable polynomial. And that's what I want to show you first. So it turns out strong multiples of p squared, in other words, multiples of p squared for mod p reasons, can be handled by algebra geometric techniques. And for an arbitrary polynomial, we're not even talking about the discriminant polynomial yet. Okay. So the observation is that that we can actually handle for any polynomial in at least two variables. Okay, so to estimate strong multiples of p squared, uh, we use the following theorem, uh, which a lot of us are now calling the ekedal uh, but this is based on a quantitative version of the ekedal sieve. And the statement is as follows. So suppose you have some subvariety uh, of n-dimensional space defined over z uh, with co-dimension at least one. So in other words, you have some subscheme of, of a n over z with co-dimension at least one. And suppose you want to count, okay, so we want to count the number of integer points, number of lattice points, a and z to the n, Okay. of bounded height, so in other words, all the coordinates are at most x in absolute value, such that if you reduce a mod p for some large p, you end up on that variety, the reduction of that variety mod p. Okay, so all lattice points in a big ball, such that when you reduce them mod p for some large p, you end up on the variety mod p. Okay, how many such points are there? The trivial estimate is x to the n, right? <laughs> so if all coordinates are bounded by x, okay, uh, their total number of points, such points is x to the n, but we want a saving over that. So we want to say that not all x to the n points have the property that when you reduce the mod p for some large p, uh, you end up on the variety mod p. So this m you want to think of as just being sort of a, a small power of x. So in all these kinds of sieves, you want to, you want to understand p squared dividing your number for some small power of the height. Okay. And show that that doesn't happen too often. So this is kind of a statement of that form. Uh, so here's the saving that we get. So it's not all x to the n points will reduce uh, mod p to a point on the variety mod p. Uh, so, if k, so if k is 1, this is, this is not saying anything. <laughs> so this really kicks in when k is at least 2. If the co-dimension, if the variety is at least co-dimension 2, then we're saying that not all such points have that property. We get a saving of m to the k minus 1 here. Uh, and then this is also less than, the second term is also less than x to the n. So this is a, uh, strictly less than x to the n, smaller order, when m is a small power of x, and k is at least 2. The co-dimension of your variety is at least 2. And this is exactly the kind of estimate that we'd like for p squared dividing g of a. But instead, we're asking for, so instead of asking for p squared dividing g of a, we're asking for a mod p to lie on some co-dimension variety, co-dimension 2 variety uh, over z, reduced mod p. OK, any questions about the statement of that? And I'll explain why it's relevant to the square free problem. Uh, but this is just a general, uh, this is just a general uh, method that works uh, when you have such a situation when you're interested in the reduction of points mod p lying on a fixed variety over z mod p. And here the implied constant depends only on v. So let me explain why this is true. For k equals 2 is where we're going to use it, so I'll just give you the sketch of the proof when k equals 2. Okay, so let's suppose that this subvariety of, of a n of co-dimension 2 is just given, without loss of generality, you can assume that it's just given by the vanishing of two polynomials, say g and h. So say it's given by two integral polynomials, g and h, equals 0. OK, and we want to count how many points there can be such that for some prime p bigger than m, when you reduce it mod p, you end up on the variety mod p. Well, what we do is let's, let's fix the first n minus 1 variables. Each of them is going to uh, be at most big x in absolute value. So there are x to the n minus 1 possibilities for those first n minus 1 variables. Right? And then we want to say, what can happen to that last variable? 
and we're going to find that it's, it's restricted. Okay, and the reason is, so once you fix the first n minus 1 variables, see, I assumed one thing about the two polynomials, which is the first polynomial is not involving xn. We can assume that. If, you, if your co-dimension two variety is given by g equals h equals 0, by elimination theory, we can get rid of the last variable in, in the first polynomial, say g. So we can assume g is just a polynomial in x1 through xn minus 1, whereas h involves all the variables. Okay, so that you can do by elimination theory. For example, replacing g by the resultant of g and h. So now if you fix the first n minus 1 variables, then the value of g is determined. So then g of x1 through xn minus 1, well, it's, it's determined once you fix the first n minus 1 variables. And it can only have boundedly many prime factors p bigger than m. Because p, remember, we assumed is a small power of, the, of, of x. So once it's at least a small power of x, then there can only be boundedly many prime factors uh, that are bigger than m. And so that essentially determined p. <laughs> All right, just by fixing the first n minus 1 variables, p is determined up to boundedly many possibilities. Let's take any one of those boundedly many possibilities for p. So for each such prime p, we now need to solve h of x1 through xn is 0 mod p, which is just a polynomial equation in one variable, which has a bounded number of roots mod p. So that means that the total number of possible x1 through xn is, well, if x to the n minus 1, which is the total number of possibilities for the first n minus 1 variables. And then remember, uh, that fixed the prime. And now h of x1 through xn has to be 0 mod p. That fixes boundedly many possibilities for xn mod p. And for a given xn mod p, uh, how many uh, integers between 0 and x can be a given value mod p? Well, the answer is uh, x over p, okay, which is bounded uh, below by x over m. Right, right, bounded above by x over m. Uh, uh, plus one. You always have to add that plus one, because even if your range was small, you may still get one root in there. Okay, so total number of possibility for x1 through xn is O of x to the n minus 1 times x over m plus 1. That's an upper bound for how many possibilities there can be for x1 through xn. And that's exactly O of x to the n over m plus x to the n minus 1, which is exactly uh, the bound we wanted when k is 2. So that's how we prove the result when, when k is 2. So that gives, that gives a saving. Even k equals 2, this is strictly less than a smaller order than x to the n. Okay, so it's a non-trivial saving. You also have the bound of h over g as well. Yeah, yeah, right. So actually, yeah, I, I skipped lots of cases <laughs> that, yeah. So for, we couldn't, one couldn't quite do this. One couldn't say g has only boundedly many prime factors if g turned out to be 0. <laughs> so you have to handle that case separately, right? The number of places where g is 0 is also on the order of x to the n minus 1, you have to show. And there are many little, little cases like that arise uh, on the way, but uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, any, other, any other questions? That's right. If the polynomial vanished identically, yeah, yeah. Right. So h, it's possible that h also vanished at that choice of x1 through xn minus 1. And so you have to count how many x1 through xn minus 1 would that happen to. And so those are little subcases that you sort of have to, have to analyze. Uh, but the basic idea is that for most things, g is not going to be 0. That will determine the prime. And then once the prime is determined, h will not be 0. And then that will determine xn up to boundedly many possibilities, mod p. Yeah. OK. OK, so the point is that if you're counting points uh, that reduce mod p to something on a codimension ver to variety over z mod p for some large prime p bigger than m, then you do get have uh, a non-trivial saving. And so how do we handle strong multiples of p squared? Uh, well, we observe that if g of a1 through a n is a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, then if it's for mod p reasons, then if you think about it, both g and its partial with respect to, say, the last variable will have to vanish uh, mod p. Okay, so if, if g is becoming a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, if it's mod p reasons, there has to be something co-dimension 2 mod p going on. If 
for just mod p reasons, implying being a multiple of p squared. Uh, and in fact, explicitly, both g and its partial have to vanish mod p uh, at that point if g is a multiple uh, of p squared for mod p reasons. So you can think about that just by, say, fixing the first n minus 1 variables and just thinking about it as a polynomial in the last variable. You'll see that uh, right away. Say, by taking the Taylor expansion with respect to the last variable, you can see it that way. So in other words, uh, a1 through an will lie on a fixed co-dimension 2 variety, mod p, that fixed variety being the variety defined by g and its partial with respect to the last variable. And so we can use the Ekedal type estimate from the previous page uh, to get uh, the saving that we wanted. So what we'd get is that the number of, uh, of points in a big box of, of uh, side length x that uh, are multiple, where g takes a multiple of p squared value for some p bigger than m is a strict power saving, uh, is a strict saving over the total x to the n points in the box. And that's exactly what you need to do, the square free save, at least for those points where uh, p squared divides g for mod p reasons. So strong multiples can actually be handled totally generally for any polynomial uh, in at least two variables. So this argument holds for any multivariable integer polynomial. Nothing special about polynomial discriminants. And that's been very useful for us in handling other polynomials as well. We know that we can dispose of this case uh, right away for any polynomial in at least two variables. So it therefore remains to estimate the number of weak multiples of p squared. In other words, places where f is a multiple of p squared genuinely for mod p squared reasons. Okay. And if you look at all the literature in the it hasn't been phrased this way, but wherever the difficulties come in square free sieves, this is where they come, <laughs> is where things are becoming multiples of p squared really for mod p squared reasons. Okay, so how do we deal with those? Uh, in all the polynomials that we've been able to handle, we deal with it as follows. We do some change of variable to transform weak multiples back into strong multiples where the Ekedal sieve does apply. <laughs> so that seems counterintuitive. It's really happening for mod p squared reasons, but often there is a change of variable you can do so that suddenly the weak multiples become strong multiples, and then you can apply the, uh, the geometric sieve. Okay, so I want to describe how we do this transformation uh, in the case of polynomial discriminants. So the idea is to embed the space of monic polynomials into a bigger space where there are more symmetries, so there are more transformations around, and where we can do this embedding so that polynomials whose discriminant is a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons are mapped uh, into points where suddenly it's changed into mod p reasons. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're taking our space, we're embedding into another space uh, where the mod p squared reasons have suddenly changed to mod p reasons. And I'll show you explicitly how, how that happens in this case. Okay, but to do this, we first have to understand, okay, because we have divided into these two cases, the strong multiples and the weak multiples. Uh, before we know what's happening to the weak multiples, we have to know where they are. Okay, so we have to understand how a polynomial uh, can have discriminant a multiple of p squared, first of all, and then when it is a multiple of p squared, when it happens for mod p reasons, and when it happens for mod p squared reasons. Okay, so let's talk about the case where the discriminant is a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons. So in other words, you just care about how the polynomial factors mod p, and that tells you that the polynomial discriminant is a multiple of p squared. So how does that happen? So here's the, here's the lemma that tells you exactly when a polynomial has discriminant a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons. Okay, so monic integral polynomial has discriminant a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons if and only if modulo p it has a root of multiplicity at least three, right? Or at least two multiple roots, right? Of multiplicity at least two, right? And that's kind of clear from the definition of the discriminant. So remember, the discriminant is the product of the uh, differences of the roots. And so if you're going to get 
uh, a p squared divided into a discriminant, you need some roots mod p to be coming together if it's only happening for mod p reasons. Right? OK, so these are, these are the kinds of cases with that the discriminant comes a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, and these can be handled, as we said, uh, using this ecodelsive method. So we don't have to worry about when p squared divides the discriminant for reasons where roots mod p are coming together okay. multiple times, because that lets you on a co-dimension 2 variety, and then you can use the, the geometric sieve. OK, so now we need to know when can the discriminant become a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons. OK, so there, you're not going to have lots of roots coming together. You're just going to have two roots coming together. But they're coming together so much that they're coming together mod p squared. Okay. Uh, so when is the discriminant a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons? And that's given by this lemma. It says that a monic integral polynomial f of x has discriminant a multiple of p squared for mod p's p squared reasons, if and only if you can translate the variable by, say, k and z, so that f of x plus k has last coefficient a multiple of p squared and the second to last coefficient a multiple of p. Okay, so when you write down your polynomial, the very last coefficient will be a multiple of p squared, and the one right before that coefficient of x will be a multiple of p. Okay, so the polynomial ends with a multiple of p and then a multiple of p squared. And so there you can see that there's only this is a double root. It's only a double root. Okay, but because that last coefficient is a multiple of p squared, it causes the discriminant to vanish mod p squared. And you can see explicitly that it's happening for mod p squared reasons. That last coefficient being a multiple of p squared is what's causing the discriminant to become a multiple of p squared. And if you change that p squared to a p, it would only force the discriminant to be a multiple of p. So that's why it's for only for mod p squared reasons that the discriminant is being a multiple of p squared in this case. OK, so those are the weak multiples of p squared. And the question is, how can we lift such polynomials to a bigger space with more symmetries so that the mod p squared condition changes to a mod p condition? So somehow we want to take that p squared and split it up into two p's and cause that to be a co-dimension 2 condition in your bigger space. Well, a natural thing to do, uh, one way to get p squared for mod p reasons is, well, if you're, the p squared is arising as a determinant, where there were like p's on, two p's on the diagonal, <laughs> right? And that would break up the p into, into two p's. And when you take the determinant, it would squash the two p's into a p squared. And so yeah, that is what we do. Uh, so we can actually do it with symmetric matrices. So we, take, we show that there exist n by n integer symmetric matrices, a and b such that if you take determinant of ax minus b, right? so if a and b are n by n matrices, then if you take determinant of ax minus b, that is uh, a polynomial of degree n in x, right? because the determinant will be degree n. Yeah. Uh, so for such an f of x, where the discriminant is becoming a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons, we find integer matrices a and b, such that determinant of ax minus b is f of x. Okay, so that's like our lift. Our f has been mapped into the space AB, and the map is just taking this determinant of AX minus B to get back to the polynomial. And what further properties do these A and B have? Well, if you look at the polynomial delta N of determinant of AX minus B, okay, so if you have two matrices, N by N matrices A and B, there's a natural discriminant polynomial on pairs of matrices A comma B. Namely, you take the discriminant of determinant of AX minus B. So that's a polynomial in the entries of A and B. Right? Its degree is suddenly n times more than it used to be. But it's still a polynomial in, in the entries of A and B. And we're going to find this lift from f to a comma b so that even though the discriminant of f was a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons, if you look at it now, the discriminant polynomial on a comma b, it's the same value. It's still a multiple of p squared, but it's now happening for mod p reasons. And the, reason, the way we're going to do that is we're going to take that p squared, which is arising as the determinant of b, and we're going to split the two p's right, and put them on some kind of diagonal. Um, 
So I'll actually show you what the matrices A and B are. So I'll show you in the case N equals 5, so degree 5 polynomials. Uh, so imagine you have a quintic polynomial, monic, f of x, such that the last coefficient is a multiple of p squared, the second to last coefficient is a multiple of p, and we're going to lift it to an a comma b. This is going to be our a, so it's just the split quadratic form. And why is this good to take as a? Well, remember, we wanted the polynomial to be monic, and the determinant of this is 1, so that's good. So if you take determinant of ax minus b, automatically this will cause it to be monic. And what do we take for b? Uh, we take that thing. And you'll notice how these p's have been split apart here. What is it? So what is the final coefficient of determinant of ax minus b? The last coefficient is just determinant of b, right? And what is the determinant of b here? Well, you see that it's just p times p times c5. So it's just c5 times p squared. So it's an arbitrary multiple of p squared, if you choose, because c5 is arbitrary. But notice the p's have been split into two there, uh, which is useful for making the end discriminant a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons. So if you work out what the determinant of ax minus b is for these two matrices a and b, you find that, first of all, it's monic. And then the next three coefficients are totally arbitrary. Uh, and then the next coefficient is p times c4. And the last coefficient is p squared times c5. So an arbitrary thing times p, and then an arbitrary p, uh, p squared times some arbitrary thing times p squared. So this is like the totally general form of a polynomial uh, where the discriminant is becoming a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons. But the point is that if you don't view this discriminant polynomial in terms of the coefficients of the quintic, but if you view it as a polynomial in the coefficients, in the entries, the non-zero entries that you see of a and b, you check that the discriminant's actually becoming a multiple of p squared now for mod p reasons. If you change all these non-zero entries that you see by just multiples of p, the discriminant of determinant of ax minus b will still remain a multiple of p squared. So it's really now happening for mod p reasons. So if we view this discriminant of determinant of ax minus b, uh, which is just the discriminant of f, as a polynomial not in the coefficients of f, but in those 12, uh, 12 variables of b. So we're actually going to always fix a to be that. So that's not even part of the variables. And we're always going to take this top 2 by 2 block of, of b to be 0. So we're not even going to consider those as variables. So the number of variables that remain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 variables of b, right? That's the things above the main diagonal that are not in that top 2 by 2 block. There are 12 variables of b. And if we look at this discriminant as just a polynomial in those 12 variables of b, then it turns out that this discriminant is a multiple of p squared in these 12 coordinates for mod p reasons. That is, p squared has been split into those p's. And now the discriminant is becoming a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons even though the discriminant as a polynomial in C1 through C, I mean A1 through A5 was a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons. Okay, but we split apart those p squareds into two p's. Okay, so this looks great, and it seems like now we can just uh, apply the Ekedal sieve and we'll be done. Um, no, because something funny happens. So we were very excited when we found this map. Uh, yeah, suddenly mod p squared reasons had been changed into mod p reasons, and this is great. But something funny happened, which is that it is for mod p reasons, but it's still only lying on a co-dimension 1 variety and not co-dimension 2. How is that possible? Uh, I'll explain that uh, right now. Uh, because it seems like if something's vanishing, uh, mod p squared for mod p reasons, it has to lie on a co-dimension 2 variety. How could it suddenly have only been on a co-dimension 1 uh, variety? Well, here's why. So, okay, first of all, let me explain what the symmetries are. This space, b, has 12 coordinates. And as I said, we wanted more symmetries. This space has a lot of symmetries. Let g0 be the subgroup of the orthogonal group of a okay, that keeps the top 2 by 2 left corner of b 0. So in other words, uh, SLN acts simultaneously on A and B, because they're both quadratic forms, by multiplication on the left and multiplication by transpose on the right. But we don't want to use all of SLN, because we want A to remain the split form. 
So the subgroup of SLN that preserves A is the orthogonal group of A. So if we have the orthogonal group of A act simultaneously on A and B, uh, A will remain as it is because it's the orthogonal group of A, and then B will move around. But now we want to take the subgroup so that it also preserves the top two by two block. Okay, that's some non-reductive subgroup of SOA, but it's a fairly big group. Uh, so that's going to be our group G0. And so G0 is a symmetry of this whole situation of these kinds of shaped matrices. G0 acts on pairs A comma B, but it preserves A because it's in the orthogonal group of A, and it preserves the shape of B by definition. Uh, and of course, note that the action of G0 also preserves equation one. In other words, determinant of AX minus B will remain that polynomial even when you act by G0, right? Because it's, it's a determinant. So if you multiply on the left and right by determinant one matrices, it's not gonna change the determinant, so it preserves that fact that you're getting that polynomial f of x. So that's what I meant by having symmetries, that we've found two matrices such that determinant of ax minus b is f of x, but we can act on ab by this huge group and you still get lots of other such matrices. Uh, one can work out what the, inver the, the invariants are for this group action. The invariants for the action of g0 on this 12-dimensional representation, v, uh, well, there are five invariants that you see right away, c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, those remain invariant. Uh, but if you do a dimension count, you find that that's not everything. There's one more invariant that's lurking around. So when G0 acts on this 12-dimensional representation, you do get the coefficients of f of x, but you get one other invariant. So together with one additional invariant, which we call the Q invariant. And the Q invariant, it turns out, just involves these top six entries of B right here. And that's there's one invariant defined polynomial in these six entries right on top, on the top of B there, uh, that remain invariant under this action of G0. There's that one invariant, it's degree six in this case. And so you might wonder, what, what does that invariant evaluate to? Well, so our first five invariants were C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. There's one thing in the picture <laughs> that we didn't use, if we evaluate Q on these pair of matrices A and B, we find that Q of AB equals P. <laughs> so we've created, we've made it, we've embedded the space of monic polynomials into a bigger space where with more symmetry, such that the space of invariants is, are the coefficients, together with this P <laughs> has come out as an extra invariant. So what that means uh, is that we have this invariant polynomial Q of AB, and we know that P squared divides the discriminant. Uh, in general, what happens here, as polynomials, Q of AB squared divides the discriminant of A comma B. <laughs> so even though the discriminant on monic polynomials is, is an irreducible polynomial, when we've done this lift to the space AB, it's actually become a reducible polynomial, and a square factor has come out, discriminant of A comma B, and that's what we made equal to P. And because it's a square factor, just think about this, if you have a, uh, if you have a, if you have a polynomial and it has a square factor, then that can become a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, but still lie on a co-dimension one variety because it's a square factor. It's just that one factor that has to vanish to cause p squared to divide the discriminant. So that's why the ekedel sieve doesn't just apply because when we've mapped it to this bigger space, that p squared uh, is happening because of qab vanishing and nothing else vanishing because qab squared is dividing the discriminant. Okay, so did, we did change mod p squared reasons to mod p reasons, but we only got the co-dimension one thing. So that's why Ekedel doesn't just apply in this case. Although in other cases, and other polynomials that we've handled, uh, that did happen and when we were done. Uh, so that's how we've handled other square-free polynomials. But this one is very, was additionally exciting because the, the lifts that we always found always had this property for polynomial discriminants. Okay, so how do we, how do we handle it? Well, okay, so Q of AB squared divides discriminant of A comma B as a polynomial, even though as a polynomial it was irreducible in the coefficients of f. Okay, well we can't apply Ekedal, but just note that it now suffices to count orbits of G0 of z on integer points of this 12-dimensional representation, satisfying height of AB, which is just defined as the height of the polynomial, uh, less than x, such that the Q invariant, this last invariant that we haven't used yet, is larger than m. Because remember, for our uniformity estimate, to do the square free sieve, we just need to know how often p squared divides the discriminant for large, uh, for large p, so p bigger than m. But all such points we've now mapped into the, 
this bigger space. Uh, and not just mapped into the bigger space, but mapped into orbits of the bigger space. Because remember, orbits still had those same invariants. So we've taken monic polynomials, uh, whose discriminant is a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons, and mapped them into this bigger space so that uh, the first five invariants remain the same, and then you have a sixth invariant, which is that p. Uh, and we want that p to be bigger than m. So we reduced it to an orbit counting problem. Uh, we have a, a representation uh, of a group, and we want to know how many integer orbits are there, uh, having bounded height and having invariants in certain ranges. Uh, and this is where are the techniques that we've been developing to count orbits with invariants in given ranges, we can, we can just apply to this problem. So we want the height, in other words, the height of C1 through C5 to be at most x, but we also want this last invariant to be bigger than m. Uh, and our methods allow us to, to count orbits with invariants in given ranges, and we work out uh, what that count is. And we find that the number of G0, G0z orbits on Vz having non-zero discriminant height less than x and Q invariant greater than m. Okay, we knew that we'd get the right answer out of this. We were hoping that it would be the saving that's expected. And it's exactly you know, what the geometric sieve would have given <laughs> had it been a co-dimension two condition. So moral really is that once you change a mod p squared condition to a mod p condition, even if it's not co-dimension two, it's, it's happening kind of morally for a co-dimension two condition. It's a co-dimension one condition that's multiple. So you still, you still get the saving somewhere, uh, some way or other. If you get the actual count, it will be right. But changing mod p squared conditions to mod p conditions is really key. Uh, OK, so we do that orbit count, and we get the saving we want. And so the corollary is that the number of monic integer polynomials of degree 5 having non-zero discriminant height less than x and discriminant to multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons for some p bigger than m is big O of, of the total count divided by m, again, here too. And the reason is just that because uh, the things that we're counting in the corollary were mapped into things we're counting into the, in the theorem. And that's exactly, the latter corollary is exactly the kind of estimate that's needed uh, to complete the square free sieve uh, on the discriminants of degree five monic polynomials. Uh, but of course, there's nothing special about the degree five. We could have made those matrices for any n. And so that, that completes the proof of, of a square free sieve for polynomial discriminants. Uh, and then in the case of, so this is, that's the statement of the theorem again. Uh, you get about 36% of polynomials have square free discriminant. And as I said, Leinster's conjecture is strictly weaker because you have to sieve less. And so that also implies Leinster's conjecture that the density uh, of f, that's the z bracket x minus f of x, is the ring of integers in q bracket x minus f of x is 6 over pi squared. Um, OK, so I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so, so far it's always been that one additional. Uh, just because of the nature of the problem, we isolate a p such that p squared is dividing it. Usually that p ends up being the additional invariant. Either that happens or you just get a co-dimension two condition where Ekedal applies. Uh, but this is the first case, this polynomial discriminant case was the first one where we didn't get something explicitly co-dimension two, but we could still use orbit counting to get the, get the saving. But one or the other happens, yeah. Yeah, we've uh, yeah we've done many polynomials now <laughs> using this, but it's not uh, it's not a systematic method yet, in the sense that I don't know the if you ask the question on which polynomials does this method apply. I don't I don't know how to answer that question. But uh, on the other hand, the many polynomials of interest for which we needed square free values. So another place where this arose, this arose, suppose you have some family of curves, and you want to know what is the density of semi stable curves inside. That said, or you know, those that have discriminant that are square free. That's a question that often arises. And we needed that for like the summer, for like the summer group sieves, for example, in work in work with Weho. Uh, we needed to know that in a certain family of curves, we had the correct density of square free discriminant curves. Uh, so that we could sieve to semi-stable curves, for example. Uh, 
And somehow, adaptations of this method have always, uh, have always worked. And we've always been able to do it. So there's always some kind of transformation that you can do or lift it somewhere so that you split apart those p's and then you're able to do the square free sieve. Uh, but that's, a, that's a kind of an algebraic geometry question. What is the nature of the polynomial so that the places where you become a multiple of p squared for mod p squared reasons, is there some kind of algebraic geometric way of splitting those p's uh, by, a chain, by a suitable change of variable so that you can apply either ekidal or, or some, you know, some, kind of, uh, some kind of other counting method. Uh, but splitting apart those p's, it seems like in all the cases that we've ever wanted so far, we've been able to do it. And the question is, can it always be done, or which poly which, what are the classes of polynomials for which this method works on? Yeah, and that I don't know. Yeah, but it has worked on many other examples. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that density can also be worked out. Uh, by, by similar methods, because it's, uh, it's only one Euler uh, factor that's changing, only one place that's changing, and the sieve only requires the large primes. So any such question can also be answered by this, although I don't know the constant offhand. Uh, yeah, 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 once you can do square free, yeah, yeah, you can also do cube free. Yeah, uh, I don't know the constant offhand, yeah, but any strictly weaker sieve can, can also be done then, yeah or that involves the same sieve for sufficiently large primes. Yeah. Alex? Yes, sorry, I was trying to get a kind of size here. In which case, uh, on which polynomial do you have any, any hope that you could apply? It's just that, I mean, of course, we, know, we believe that for any polynomial, say, for a variable, <laughs> uh, you will, uh, it will take um, a square free value of the right proportion of the time. Right, right. right. Right, right. So it would seem that the barrier of what was known was that we uh, pick a number of variables. Right, where right. It's uh, better to actually log n times the number of variables. Right, 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 right. So I said it's really quite strong. So I wanted to get a sense of how special it was. Right, right. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, as I said, any, any polynomial that we really needed to know the density of square free values, we worked hard enough, long enough, there was some transformation that we always found. But uh, maybe all the polynomials that we were always interested in had, had this kind of structure that, that we were using secretly. That, but I don't know what that, I don't know. I feel like there should be some algebra, geom, algebra geometric way of saying what the structure of the polynomial is that allows this kind of transformation. And I don't, but I don't, know, I don't know how to say it, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, what is exactly the property that we're using? Yeah, and that, yeah. That, that's a great, yeah, great question, which I don't know the answer to yet. It's a great thing to think about. Yeah. So I have a quick question. What is Ekedal's uh, original motivation for this shape, or have you changed it quite a bit? Um, he didn't have. Uh, his motivation had something to do with counting singular matrices mod p or something like this. Uh, That's right. That's what his paper is called. It's called an infinite version of the Chinese remainder theorem. Yeah. And he doesn't work out the quantitative error terms, uh, which are sometimes useful in these, in these sieves. So that's the, that's the additional contribution here. But the, the idea is his. Yeah. The co-dimension two variety giving you some kind of saving is his idea. And making it totally quantitative with the optimal error terms is, uh, has been useful in, in subsequent sieves. So the question is, what is cube, does cube free have an interpretation in terms of the ring of integers, or in terms of discriminants of orders? Mm -hmm. 
you know, it would be something like uh, the count of all orders, and it would, you know, it would give uh, a count of all monogenic orders that have index at most, some, you know, uh, maybe something like square free index in the maximal order, something like that. So instead of saying index one, it would be allowing some square free index, yeah, something like that. Yeah, thank you.